Hi there, my name is Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. It's the most wonderful time of the year, and, and that time is of course Halloween time. Anyone who thinks Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year is straight up mistaken, and in fact, you make me sick. Christmas, <coughs> that's what I think of that. You can take your jolly old elf and shove him up your jolly old ass. Sorry for that outburst. This is the last video in our exploration of all things Salem's Lot, so I'm rocking the Drac Duds one last time. There are five Salem-centric videos in this series, one for the novel, another for the overrated 1979 TV miniseries, another for the short stories Jerusalem's Lot and One for the Road, one for the worst ever vampire movie and possibly worst movie ever in general, A Return to Salem's Lot, and this video for the 2004 two-part TV miniseries. In one of the five Salem's Lot videos, I had a stake driven into my heart by my seven-year-old daughter, which I'm certain has not had any lasting negative effects on her. Uh, however, she starts preemptive therapy next week just to be safe. That clip is hiding somewhere in the Salem's Lot series, so get you some of that. Now before we get started, it's time for Vlad Joke. Where do vampires get their school supplies? Pennsylvania. History and background. This two-part TV miniseries first aired on TNT in June of 2004. Although the novel and original mi miniseries were set in the 70s, this version takes place in the 2000s. There isn't a great deal of information out there regarding the production itself, but there is some enjoyable info from the biography of Rob Lowe, who plays Ben Mears in this adaptation, that we will touch on later. Is it by the book? From the opening scene, it's, it's pretty clear that this adaptation is going to take some liberties with the original story, but sometimes that's okay. As long as the changes serve the story and make sense for the format. While this opening scene is not at all by the book, I can't say it wasn't intriguing or, or, or that it was unenjoyable. I'm curious to see where they take things from here. There's a whole lot of narration by way of voiceover happening, which is often frowned upon, but my guess is they found it was the most efficient way to get the necessary information out to the viewer within the confines of the show's limited runtime. Let's be honest, voiceovers are lazy, and anyone who utilizes them risks being viewed as a hack and a fraud. The criticism is known as show, don't tell, and is founded on the premise that if you are forced to tell your audience what they need to know as opposed to portraying it within the story, your screenplay is poorly written. Yep, only hacks and frauds use voiceovers. Unfortunately, the order of events and circumstances leading up to them have sometimes been changed in unnecessary ways that don't add anything to the story and don't make any sort of meaningful impact as a result of being changed. However, unlike the original 1979 version, this adaptation has great pacing and, in my opinion, the writers predominantly made the cuts and changes in all the right places. The essence of the story remains intact and the details that were left out or reworked don't substantially detract from its overall impact for the most part. One thing this version does cut out that I felt was unfortunate is, is remove a significant part of Ben's backstory and the inner struggle that he is experiencing. This was most likely done to save time, but we lose the deeper, more personal connection with Mears, which I don't think was a wise idea. Most of the story's characters are present and accounted for, although not always portrayed as they were in the novel, and in some cases, characters have been combined. The story was modernized to some degree to reflect the era in which it was filmed, but 
It doesn't negatively impact the story. Vibe and tone. This story doesn't romanticize the relationship of Ben and Susan nearly as much as the novel, which I think helped maintain the right vibe and prevented the series from devolving into a genre-hopping mess that would have struggled to be both a romance and a horror series. Like the original TV miniseries, th this adaptation likely could have been so much better were it not for the limitations of what you can and can get away with on TV. There are rumors of a new Salem's Lot movie coming to the big screen. Maybe. Theaters are ever a thing again. Fucking COVID. There are rumors of a new Salem's Lot movie coming to the big screen, swirling about the internet, and I hope it comes to fruition so we can get that R-rated version we deserve. Visual effects, sound, editing, and cinematography. The Marston House is, is very well designed in this show. Both the interior and exterior are foreboding, dilapidated, and creepy. As far as creature and makeup effects go, this version is a bit better than the original, however that is a low bar to clear. The makeup is subtle and makes people look sick and pale rather than straight up monstrous, but it's often pretty bad. As far as visual effects go, there there is this one scene where a vampire crams himself into a narrow ventilation shaft in an effort to get at Ben Mears, and, and frankly, it's it's some of the worst special effects, like maybe ever. Honestly, after that, the effects are consistently terrible. We experience some flashbacks that are portrayed in a grainy, fiery orange and red. It's not a bad look, honestly. Uh, the sound editing is well done and the eerie soundtrack is engrossing. Unlike the 1979 version, we are allowed some blood and gore, but just barely. You know, it figures we get two different screen adaptations and they're both made for TV movies. Boo! Also, there is one scene that is straight up in the style of a Tim Burton movie, but just one scene? So it feels out of place within the context of the entire show. Like, why didn't you shoot the whole thing like that? It would've been way better. Soundtrack. The eerie horror music elements are great. There is some atmospheric ambiance and pretty piano passages underscored with whispering voices and the laughter of children. It's not so much a score as it is a collage of creepy sounds. But then sometimes it sounds like a Batman movie score. It's a bit sporadic, but it, it, it works somehow. During the end credits, we're gifted with a punk rock version of Painted Black by the Rolling Stones, and, and it's, it's not great. Cast and acting. The casting for this movie was far better. Casting for this two-part TV miniseries was far better than that of the original version. Uh, there are some notable cast members, including Rob Lowe, whose representation of Ben Mears is in line with the portrayal of the book, Donald Sutherland, Andre Brower of Brooklyn Nine-Nine fame, and Samantha Mathis of American Psycho and The Strain, which the Strain is a super enjoyable vampire TV series that I highly recommend. There's the show, the graphic novels, the freaking books, all of it. The Strain. Get some of that. Sutherland plays Richard Straker, and he straight up looks like evil Santa Claus. Like, we're talking full snow white head of hair and snow white beard. They they even have him wearing like this velvety red suit. I, I, like, was this some sort of unusual purposeful decision? Or like, did no one on set notice this? Like, how was this allowed to happen? 
The master vampire himself, Kern Barlow, is played by Rutger Hauer of Blade Runner and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie, not the series, fame. And it, it's regrettably one of this TV series' worst actors and has what I consider to be one of the world's most ridiculous soul patches. I mean, that thing sticks out like a turkey beard. For those of you who didn't know, turkey, turkeys have beards. In his memoir, Love Life, great title, Rob, Rob Lowe stated that Rutger Hauer showed up on set and didn't know his lines. Lowe said, quote, I once starred in a big miniseries that culminated with the villain giving a two-page monologue trying to goad me into killing him. The actor playing the bad guy wanted to ad-lib his own version of the movie ending speech. Although he was playing a vampire, he went into a soliloquy about being a cowboy. The director was not impressed. After a very tense negotiation, the actor was forced to can his self-penned opus and stick to the original script. There was only one problem. He hadn't bothered to learn it, unquote. Lowe went on to state that cue cards were placed next to his head and Howard read the lines to him. What I would give to find a clip of that cowboy vampire monologue. Now you listen here, partner. I'm gonna give you what till the count of three before I suck the blood out of your lily liver carcass and leave your remains for the vultures. Final thoughts. This series isn't everything I wanted it to be, but in my humble opinion, it was much better than the original series. In almost every way. I'm sure that a lot of people would disagree with that sentiment, but everyone is entitled to their wrong opinion. If you're a diehard fan of King, you should watch it. It's, it's not a bad take on the story. If you're not a diehard King fan, like you're not really missing out on anything special, and you could probably just skip this one. Just, just read the book. Just read the book instead, or, or check out the audiobook version if that's your thing. I did. It's excellent. All right, that does it for the Salem's Lot series. Join me next time for a look at Rage, the first book Stephen King published under the pen name Richard Bachman, and what would prove to be one of King's most controversial stories to date. The, his, definitely his most controversial story to date, which is no small task considering Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King, pretty please, with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking. <laughs>